Come on, Annie. Let's go to the movies. This is the Cine Realist, episode 515. My name is Kyle. My name is James. And my name is Zach. And we're here to talk about movies, movie lists, and movie obsession for the next hour or so. Zach, James, welcome. Thanks, man. Thank you. I'm here. You are here. <laughs> Zach, you're there too. Yeah. <laughs> I am, man. <laughs> Pretty soon, I'm going to start taking over the intro to the show, because Kyle never gives us a lead-in. He's just like, and we're here. I, I Dead always, silence. I always And I tell him, about... like, just plan something. Just plan a question, anything. And he's just, nah, I'll do that next time. Oh, yeah. And I think about it. I'm like, yeah, next time I'll do something. And then it comes to be Sunday night. And I'm like, oh, crud. we got to record soon. And I, got, I got nothing. I can't do it under pressure. Uh, we, need a, we need a fully produced song and dance every week, Kyle. All right, from now on. I can write a new song every episode? Yes. Oh, boy. Yeah. Okay. Typical, yeah. like, cool guy band teacher, you know what I mean? <laughs> this is what we expect of you. <laughs> All right, well, Zach, give me another chance here in the future. I will think of something to say that's not just, hey. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, man. <You're> no problem. <laughs> Appreciate it. I was listening to a, a YouTube video uh this week that was like a guy who does like 25 minute breakdowns of like popular uh rock songs and it was pretty great and all i could think about while i was listening to this guy talk was kyle and that drop that audio clip (laughs) like typical cool guy band teacher because the way he was just breaking down everything like it's this kind of fourth fifth i don't know beat i don't know music terminology but um (laughs) apparently not but it was great (laughs) Was he like breaking down chords and the rhythm and yeah, and giving like musical theory behind what the authors of the music might have been thinking? But my question was, did My Chemical Romance really think that through <laughs> when they wrote <laughs> so, that song? You know what I mean? It was like, yeah, that's it. Was like, I'm pretty sure they just played this because they've heard this rhythm pattern before and they liked it, and so they made a variation of it, and that's how they ended up on it. Like, I don't know how strong in like you know musical history some of those artists were when they wrote things yeah there's definitely some of people just hearing something and saying oh that sounds good or noodling around Mm -hmm. and coming up with a harmony that sounds great i i always think of um brian wilson from the beach boys as being the best example of a just a natural genius Mm -hmm. right so he wrote most of the beach boys songs and he had no musical training. No, he didn't go to school. He just had like a piano in his basement as a kid that he messed around with. And mm. he came up with all these crazy harmonies because he was like, oh, this just sounds good to me. Mm. And then it just turns out that other people think it sounds good too. So then, you know, hence we got the Beach Boys. But he's one of those uh, artists where you can take his songs and look at like the chord structure. And it's not a traditional pop chord structure. Or, you know, he, uh, most artists with a classical training, whatever you want to call it, would write a melody and would use one set of chords. But Brian Wilson's like, well, I don't know. I think this sounds good because he doesn't have that background. So he just does what sounds good to him. Mm-hmm. And that's what gets, you know, his own sort of unique sound to his music. Yeah, so, I'm, sh- I'm sure people dissecting it are like the genius of him is that he'll use this specific method over that specific method. When in reality, he wasn't even thinking that way. He was just like, oh, these two things sound good together. Yes. I I don't care if it's the traditional way because he didn't even know what the traditional way was type of thing. But I would still say he's a genius because he just has that ear where he can hear things Mm -hmm. and put it together. Like there's plenty of people who are writing songs in their basement who are not good at it and are not following, (laughs) you know, traditional rules. And it sounds terrible. Sure. Although there were plenty of people in that era who also thought the Beach Boys sounded terrible. Like cheesy terrible or just didn't like... Like, or, like purists who didn't like rock and roll in general. Well, oh, yeah. Okay, <laughs> yes. You're right. You're, if you're taking anyone over 40 at that time. Sure. Yeah. But... Because he was breaking rules and it sounded weird. It was. people. Yeah. Now it sounds kind of tame compared to weird music these days. Well, it's got to evolve. It has to go somewhere. Right. 
you, you exactly. can't just jump straight to like droning. You have to have a progression to get there. <laughs> sure. I saw a, uh, a meme this week that uh, um, Yoko Ono was threatening to put her music on Spotify. Oh. <laughs> they didn't get rid yeah. of Joe Rogan. <laughs> <laughs> Which yeah, is great. Have you ever listened to Yoko Ono's music? Um, yes. I've heard a little bit of her stuff. And then on that Get Back documentary, she's kind of like jamming with the band. Mm-hmm. And her jamming is, I want to call it screeching. I don't know if there's a nicer term to put what she's doing vocally. I think she would even call it screeching. Okay, all right. Yeah. It's more like performance art in a way. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I do like her visual art. I saw a art installation of hers in the late 90s in Minneapolis and it was really cool. I like her music too. I wouldn't okay. listen to it like on its own track after track, but like listening to it as a piece of art. I do think it's interesting. So, speaking of Spotify, Joe Rogan, mm-hmm. who needs to leave Spotify for Spotify to kick off Joe Rogan? Taylor Swift. Yeah, major it- pop stars. I thought Taylor Swift was not on Spotify anyway. She's on Spotify. She is. Okay. Didn't she have a lawsuit with them or had some issue with them a couple years ago? She definitely resisted longer than most of them, but she's okay. on there for sure at this point. Um, I don't, I don't like, I understand the big artists I'm sure make money off of it. Nothing compared to what they made or could have made had CDs still been a thing. And so to a lot of newer artists, like this is the only revenue they know of, mm-hmm. but, um, Kind of feels like if you're gonna pay artists pennies when they don't mind when they leave you, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's hard to feel yeah. sorry for you. Like, uh, it, what if like all the small artists that were making pennies just like left? Do you think that would be enough to hurt them? Where like all they have left over are the people who really make good money on Spotify, or would they just be like, well, we only have big artists now? <laughs> yeah, I, I think. I think the question is, what draws people to Spotify? Are, are they drawn by the small artists, or are they drawn by the fact that they can hear Taylor Swift whenever they want? Yeah. It's probably, it's probably such a big pool of people to think about. It's yeah. impossible to say people listen to it for this one thing. Um, but if they were to get rid of a few big artists and a bunch of small artists, I'd have to imagine people would start questioning why they're still listening on Spotify if mm-hmm. they could still get a wide variety of those artists on another service like if Google Music still carried all the major artists and those smaller ones mm-hmm. why would why would you pay Spotify $10 a month when you could pay Google $10 a month or Tidal or Tidal <laughs> which is technically <laughs> Apple right didn't Tidal sell out to Apple I believe you're correct yeah that title is now apple music yep um why did why don't people why didn't people i guess it's because it wasn't COVID 19 wasn't going on nobody ever get got mad at apple when they were like the distributor of joe rogan's podcast the primary distributor were they yeah. the, not the exclusive though they weren't the exclusive but they were the majority yeah, but just he was on everything, and that there was just the biggest. That's sure. different than like the exclusive. They have a contract, and then they pay him a ton of money. Like mm-hmm. uh, iTunes didn't pay him anything, right? So that's the big issue at hand. Is like he they're paying him to be there. He's the only he's only there. Mm-hmm. He's their television show, their movie. Yeah. He's their exclusive artist. Yeah, I can see it. Hmm. Interesting. It's kind of like, um, what if Netflix was to just hand somebody money and be like, make whatever you want. We know you're popular and we wash our hands of whatever you say and do with all Isn't that what they do with Dave Chappelle. Yeah. Yeah. I think Dave Chappelle is exactly a good example of that. Yeah, I guess so. So I guess Netflix does do that. I mean, Netflix also censors their shows for their country so that they can get viewers over there, too. So, Right. Do you think they would continue to do it with Dave Chappelle if Dave Chappelle was not 
as streamed as he is? No. <laughs> no. No, it's it's because he he gets a lot of eyeballs. Yeah, it's because he's <laughs> Dave Chappelle. Yeah. Do you think when Dave Chappelle makes the news like he did with his last special, the guys at Netflix are just like, ka-ching? Yes. <laughs> right, because if, if that keeps people another week, another month, so they can, you know, wh- whether they like Dave Chappelle or not, if they're like, oh, we should watch this to find out how offensive it is or whatever. Yeah. Like, all Netflix cares about is great. It's another week of subscription I got out of you. Guys, yeah. I'm wondering, what to you is more essential to your lifestyle? Netflix or HBO Max? Right now, HBO yeah. Max. But I do like Netflix. Like yesterday, yesterday and the day before, it took me two days to get through season two of Cheer. Have you watched that show? No. No. Oh, it's so good. What is it? It's so good. It's about cheerleaders. <laughs> and uh, have you ever seen um, Last Chance You? You seen no, that no. one about the football players? So Last Chance You is about football players who play football for a junior college because they're college age and some of them aren't good enough to play for a major college. And some of them are good enough to play in the NFL practically. And their grades are so awful that they've been kicked out of like major schools and lost huge scholarships and like should be playing um, top level college football, but instead they're playing junior college football. Anyway, that's Last Chance You. It's a great documentary series. Uh, so the same team that made that made this cheerleading documentary series where they started filming in 2018 into 2019. Season one is really good, but then season two. They start filming like in August of 2019 and the big event happens in April of 2020, which if you remember what happened March to April, 2020 is the world changed. And so they got kind of like a good two thirds of a season out of the filming and then coronavirus hit. Yeah. And then they waited until they could go back into production and like the cheer team could come back and practice again. And they like totally missed the championships because everything got canceled. And, um, and in the interim, somebody who was really popular in season one of cheer turns out he was texting a 14 year old, like dirty pictures of himself and stuff like that. And so he's now sitting in prison awaiting trial. And he was like one of the stars of season one. And so, um, it's just super addicting TV, even if you don't care about cheerleading. It's one of those shows that I wish, like, Zach, I know your daughter really loves um, Simone gym- Biles. gymnastics and stuff like that. Simone Biles gymnastics. Um, I wish she could watch the show. There's too many F words in it, so she, she couldn't. I'm not suggesting she could. But uh, seeing young people be really into something <laughs> and, like, work really hard at it to be the best at it i think is uh it's fun to watch and if you don't know cheerleading is really hard why well, yeah i mean i'm sure it's very <laughs> athletic i mean i never i've seen like the i've caught in passing like the espn championships or whatever where they're like doing those pyramids and stuff like that and i'm like oh that's cool but you don't realize just how much goes into that until you watch uh eight hours of a season of cheer and then you're like oh okay these people practice like twice daily for six months to be able to do that like one two minute thing it's crazy and they all break bones and stuff like that so is your answer to zach's question hbo max or netflix i don't know okay they both have good things i guess is what i'm saying (laughs) okay HBO Max has a bunch of limited series that I've been watching lately because I haven't been wanting to get into something super long. And so... You, um, you're not now, ready to make a commitment. You just kind of want to... Yeah, that's why I, I could watch Cheers field. Season 2 because I had already seen Season 1. So it's just like yeah. eight episodes and then I'm caught up. Um, now I'm watching Cobra Kai, eight episodes. Mm, yeah, that's fun. I'm, I'm caught up. I, I like limited series because mm-hmm. you know they have a story in mind. They're going to tell it in four to 13 episodes Mm -hmm. and then that's it 
and and you know you're getting a complete or hopefully you're getting a complete story and not a you know set up for another season and then you have like little big lies which seemed like it's gonna be a little a a limited series told the complete story and then said "Ah, let's do season two (laughs) you're not quite sure why it it's fun to watch but doesn't really need to exist huh did they use the same characters or did they at least change the characters no they use the same characters Mm. in the same town it's sort of they didn't really because the first season is based on a book which is a complete story like it told Mm -hmm. the book and then season two is like well let's see what happens afterwards and I don't like that. I like when they tell, I don't mind if they have a limited series, they tell a story from beginning to end. And then they're like, we're going to make this antho- an anthology. You know what I mean? Like season two, totally different group of people. Oh, like true maybe, style. Yeah. Maybe the same circumstances type of thing, but um, yeah. Or like uh, Fargo. Did you ever see the Fargo TV show? No, they did that where it's not like, None of Fargo, the TV show, ever takes place in Fargo. It's all just like happens to be in places like Fargo, basically. That's silly. Zach's shaking his head. <laughs> Why <laughs> does none of it take place in Fargo? Um, because they're the, the Fargo TV show has very little to do with Fargo. It's so. Why is it called Fargo? Because it's all about like um small town Midwestern crime. Sure, but why is it called Fargo? I don't know. Um, Because it's the vibe of Fargo. It's a vibe (laughs) show, Zach. Is it even the vibe of Fargo, or is it a different vibe? No, it's the vibe. Uh, Season one and season two of Fargo are, I mean, amazing. Awesome TV. It's not even in Fargo. That's why the movie is called Fargo, because it's in Fargo. No, it's in Brainerd. It's not even Fargo. Yeah. They're next to Fargo. Fargo. It's it's not in Fargo, though. Yeah, yeah, but it's... That's why the show is connected, is because it's not Fargo. that is not why. (laughs) They they took an existing IP with name recognition. That could be, but the guy who made that, right? His name's uh, Noah Baker, I think. If I got that right off the top of my head, that's amazing. Um, He... This isn't the first show he's done that for. He did another show. Oh, what's the name of it? It was an X-Men TV show. Oh, uh, it starts with an L. Legion? Legion. Yeah, Legion, which was which is based on X-Men. Well, like some variation of X-Men. But that show could just as easily not be related to X-Men at all. <laughs> I mean, it's uh that's a wild show and it's really good. And uh, because of those two shows, I'll watch anything Noah Baker does. It's like they make a Star Trek series, but this time they're on a ship in the ocean and they're just sailors. And it's called, but it it's a ship, but it's Star Trek. Yeah, Sea Quest. Yeah, but they call it Star Trek. Okay. <laughs> right at at the base, I would agree that that's how different this is. <laughs> but uh, in execution, you liked it. I mean. Yeah, because he, in the X Men version of this, he spun the idea of mutants in ways that, like, the comics could never, have never done, and so that's what made it interesting. In a world where there's like a million um, comic book based television shows, and most of them on the CW, he made one for <laughs> FX that's like kind of the anti superhero tv show um which pissed off a lot of people in the beginning of season one they were like what am i watching this isn't even the x-men and then by episode eight it's like mind blown (laughs) anyway kyle do you have an answer to this question hbo max versus netflix oh geez Uh, um i think right now i watch more hbo max Mm -hmm. but my wife and my son, especially my son, watch more Netflix. So I could not give up Netflix. I I just got to keep both. Sure. Yeah. Zach, you asked the question. We expect an answer. Yeah, Netflix. Yeah, HBO Max might be the new hot thing, but you got to stick with the the streamer that brought you. (laughs) 
No, do you, you have to? You I don't do. know if you have to do there's that. There's no loyalty. <laughs> no, there's definitely do. loyalty. No, 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 there's loyalty. There's streamer loyalty. <laughs> no. I have no loyalty. When Support it comes to the that. home team. I am curious yeah. to Poor see. Poor Netflix, the little guy, just needs your help. He needs your extra 15 a month. Yeah. For 15 a month, you too can support a struggling streamer. You guys pay 15 Who? a month for Netflix? That might be with my uh, DVD in the mail service. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, HBO is owned by Warner Media, so I'm not exactly <laughs> hurting oh, for them. Wait, are we sure about that? Did The Matrix tell us that? <laughs> <laughs> over and over and, and over, over again. again. <laughs> yeah. Um, Who owns them? I will AT&T. be curious. <laughs> yeah. I'll be curious to see if they can uh, keep my interest in 2022 just because there's no they won't be putting new releases on like oh no day and date date. yeah so um and i've realized just this past week that i haven't gone to a movie theater in january yet i gave amc 22 dollars of my money (laughs) (laughs) So I probably need to either start going to the movie theaters or cut that back. Like if I'm if I'm if I'm only gonna go once a month, then I don't need to give them twenty two dollars. But if Plus I'm gonna it's go not twice, the most convenient theater for you. Um, I mean it's not bad. Yeah, but Epic's closer to you. That's true. That Epic though is uh, I don't know, it's a special. You one. don't like it? It's a great one. I the few times I've been there, it might just have been the theater I was into. I was in. Um, it feels like their theaters, nobody cares about this. Their theaters are short. Like no matter where you're sitting, you're like right next to the screen, like right, like the screen's right there. And like, even if you're like 10 rows up the stadium seating, you're like the screen's just right there in front of your face, like really close to you. <laughs> I don't like that. <laughs> well, there's a certain amount where like just the physics of of length play into it where like just like any other theater if you're enough rows back you can't be that close to the screen no matter what that's what i mean like theaters are like they don't follow the nature's of law (laughs) the laws of nature it's just no no no. this is not what i'm saying i'm (laughs) saying like you're still there 10 rows at epic have got to be similar to 10 rows (laughs) at amc i'm saying like your typical movie theater that i that cool I'm guy, that I'm like, used cool to, guy movie theater <laughs> that I'm used to going to have yeah. four or five rows on the ground, okay. and then you start your stadium seating, and your stadium seating goes ten to fifteen rows, whereas at Epic you have like five feet of space that nobody's sitting in because there's no chairs there, and then you immediately start your ten rows of stadium seating. So there's just, it's a stubbier theater. Okay, so James, what, what you need to do is you need to think about, when I go to a regular theater, if I'm sitting in row 10, right? So I've got my five, then the aisle, and then my five. How many right. feet back is that? And then translate that to epic distance, and that's how far back you should sit He needs epic. An, an epic equation. Exactly. <laughs> you need a converter. An, an epic like, multiplier. If I enjoy row eight at AMC, that means I need row 11 at epic. A 12.2. Yeah. On on top of that, the incline of the um okay stadium seating <laughs> is much sharper at Epic. So like when if you look at the headrest of the seat in front of you at AMC, their headrest is like knee level, right? The top of their headrest is knee level, whereas at Epic it's like ankle level. So there's actually like a bigger gap in the stadium steps up. And so um you just move up faster. So if you sit in the top row of an Epic, it's like you're looking down at the screen. Whereas if you sit at the top row of an AMC or a Regal, you're slightly above the mid eye line. All right, James, I think I've never seen Epic Theater, but I think mm-hmm. I can tell you what's your ideal role, row already. My ideal row is at no, an no, AMC no, me, or a me. Regal. <laughs> okay. <laughs> at, at Epic, you need to sit. Not the very back row, not the one before that. You need to sit the third row from the back. And I think that it's, you'll be happy with that. No. Just my guess. Nope. Nope. No, Kyle, don't you understand that 
it's garbage. It's it, the theater is garbage and there's the, no good seat. The other thing I don't like is that <laughs> you literally Epic paid me a lot of money to defend them this episode, guys. So we're going <laughs> to see this at through. Epic. There's nobody there. It's like chaos. You walk in, there's like a, they have literally no ticket people. They only have touch <laughs> it's a touch screen. Right. How great. And then from there you go into the snack food place and it's like a supermarket. You basically just pull off the shelf what you want. You don't talk. Right. To, you don't talk to anybody, and then uh, you check out. I don't remember if there's a person when you check out. <laughs> there's just and a then, donation box, <laughs> right? There's a donation box. It's like <laughs> church on Sunday, and then uh, and then you just walk into your theater. They don't even take your ticket. This is madness. Weird. <laughs> this, this actually reminds me of a question, and we were kind of talking about this um, via text earlier today. Do we you were. guys prefer assigned seating or do you like the old way where you bought your ticket and showed up and chose your seat when you got there? Assigned seating any day. All right. The old the old way. Okay. So, Zach, why do you like the old way? Because I <laughs> I find assigned seating is too rigid. I I like to feel it out in the theater. I don't know what the theater looks like until I get in there. But don't you? Oh I mean, my gosh! How many different theaters do you go to? <laughs> I don't. I don't have memorized like what theater seven looks like. I no, but, I go to a multiplex with like twenty four different theaters, and they have different sizes. Yeah, but there's like three different sizes. Like you have your 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 huge one, like your ultra screen, your mega screen, your IMAX, whatever you want to call it. And then you have your next size down, which is still probably fifteen rows. It's like your super screen. And then you have like your just everything else one, which is eight rows. There's, uh, there's three options. Like you, I, you kind of know. I disagree. I think I think at the Regal, there's probably like six or seven different kind of configurations. As really, far as that many proportions? I think so. Okay. And also, when you go and you take your seat, and then you realize the person in front of you who has assigned seating has like really, you know, they're Marge Simpson. Then I want the freedom to get up and be like, "Well, I don't want to sit behind Marge Simpson." And then so you move somewhere else. But if it's assigned seating, you can't do that. It's There's just luck of the draw. Seating? It's stadium seating, but it's, you know, some, occasionally you're near a talker or someone who's obnoxious. And you yes. just want the freedom to be able to move. Or but you're the just freedom stuck. to tell them to shut up. <laughs> Sometimes you don't want to do that. So I'm just saying with assigned seating, you're <laughs> That's stuck. you and I differ. <laughs> I'm saying you're stuck with assigned oh, seating. Um, okay. Yeah, you're like the character in The Lost Daughter who goes gets the, the the ticket taker to quiet people down oh no i don't get the ticket taker to quiet people down i use myself to quiet people down <laughs> i don't um, need to involve some false authority figure okay yeah, no so i'm already I, getting I have, to theater early so a sign seating just locks me in i don't like i that. have two counter arguments okay okay so or maybe they're, they go hand in hand um if it's a sign seating and the movie starts and it's pretty empty and you're not happy with your seat, do you change it? Yeah. Okay. So that's not an issue. And well, it is an issue because for 20 minutes I'm nervous that I sat in someone's seat. And I, I'm thinking about that instead of the Okay. Movie. And then if you're in a theater that is not assigned seating and it's packed and Marge Simpson's in front of you, can you do anything about it anyway? So under your hypothetical, um, if it's worst case scenario mm -hmm. then no i can't move anywhere else okay yeah so i i guess i don't see r r besides the fact that that 20 minutes of oh my goodness am i sitting in someone's seat which isn't you know then you just if they show up you say oh my bad and then you go somewhere else it's not that bad uh <laughs> I, I don't see i don't see a huge difference it's a little bit more assigned bad, seating yeah. versus the not assigned based on your concerns this is why assigned seating is the best because I can leave literally when a movie starts from my house, <laughs> get in the car and drive to the movie theater and roll in right as the last trailer is playing. And I know that my seat that I reserved is sitting there waiting for me in the perfect pole position because I bought that ticket three days earlier. And that scenario just would never happen without assigned seating. Another question. Yeah. I, I don't know how this works. It's probably different for James. 
Mm-hmm. But for you, Kyle, when you do a signed seating, let's say you buy a ticket a couple days ahead of time. Yeah. Are you paying some sort of service fee? Oh, no, because I have the free membership. <laughs> so I put in my rewards card, and I don't have mm-hmm. to pay the service fee. You don't have a service fee? No, because I have a rewards card, which is free. And with my rewards card, when I spend enough money, I get like free popcorn and things like that. So I'm getting free popcorn, and I'm not paying a service fee. And the Wait, phone what? number they have is Megan's old phone number with her maiden name. So there's no data being collected. So it, it, it the, is like a perfect situation. The here. free popcorn is not an argument in your favor because you get a free popcorn with the membership, whether you buy online or have open seating. No, I'm okay. Fine. We'll, we'll, we'll get the free. No, no, you I'm not don't saying, get the free popcorn. No, it's not just the free popcorn. It's also like like money I spend then gets turned into like. Movie bucks I can use at the concession well, stand. That would happen for, even if there wasn't assigned seating. True. It's okay. It's fine. not a perk then for assigned seating. Get rid of all. Get rid of all those things. <laughs> because I have the membership, I don't pay the service fee. There. And the membership gotcha. doesn't doesn't cost me anything annually. So I would say too that I don't know how I don't know the Regal app. I know Zach goes to Regal more than AMC. I exclusively go to AMC because they get my um, monthly money. Free money. Yeah. Yeah, um, lately, it's definitely a gym, <laughs> gym member situation, for sure. Um, but on my app, it will t- it will show you the physical layout of the theater. So oh, yeah. even, if, even if you weren't buying online, you should use the app, because it will tell you in advance like what the theater looks like. The other th- reason why reserved seating is great is because it brought to us a world where you can pull up the theater and you can see whether it's going to be full or not, like whether there's a lot of people in the theater or not. And uh, in a world where there was no assigned seating, I don't, maybe eventually would have gotten that. I don't know. But uh, we definitely got that because of assigned seating. Another thing it does is it, it really gives priority to people who plan ahead. (laughs) It definitely does. Exactly. You know, and, and so you can't, that, serendipitous just you know i'm gonna show up at the theater and watch a movie those days are are harder harder no, those days are better because i know days in advance i'm gonna go see a movie anyway so i don't have to worry about what time i need to show up and do i get the seat i want honestly let's lay it out <laughs> when was the last time you went to a movie theater having no idea what you were gonna see and when it started no, no, because no. it's been that, twenty years. Yeah, twenty if years not since I've done that. Since I've okay, done that. it hasn't been twenty years for me, but I will say this. Okay, uh, much more common is I show up for a theater uh, that I want to go see, realize that it's full, and so then I'm gonna like, well, I'll watch the next show, and that one's already like mostly full because people have pre bought their tickets with a signed seating, <laughs> and so, it would be more convenient. By more <laughs> common, you mean like within the last within the cell phone era, you've literally just not bothered to reserve a seat and then go into a theater and it's been sold when, out. When I went to Spider-Man uh, No Way Home, it was almost completely sold out and I had to sit in the front row. And when did you buy your ticket? At there, like 10 well, minutes before the That's movie. your problem, Zach. You, can, you, you can't expect. <laughs> like, no. It, it's okay. It, no, it's no, like, but here's, <laughs> Kyle, but here's the thing is that there were empty seats in the theater in the back of people that didn't show up, right? They pre-bought yeah. their tickets and then yeah. they didn't show up. But had they not had reserved those tickets, I could have just sat in those seats from the beginning. I didn't have to sit in the front row for 10 minutes and then go fill in their empty seat. They just would have never showed up at the theater and bought a ticket. Yeah. Mm. But you can plan ahead. <laughs> oh, sure. Okay. So like it's it seems to be the, the, the biggest issue is I don't plan ahead. And, that, and this new system of planning ahead is inconvenient for me. No, no. It, it brings in like seat competition. What's and I don't, seat I, I don't, competition? I don't need seat competition what? included in my entertainment Who, experience. Who's competing for seats? Yeah, you're the spend, one that's like first come, no. first serve. That seat competition. <laughs> no, yeah. I have to spend days jostling for a good seat. No, <laughs> no days. You. You, you don't jostle. <laughs> you you check it. It's not like like you're not bidding on that seat hoping you get it. Either you get it or you don't. Like there's no <laughs> exactly. There's it's no very unforgiving. To it. It's unforgiving. <laughs> <laughs> it, th- this is our our brave new world we live in, Zach. It get is. in line for your premium. Access. I just think they should leave a couple theaters open to open seating and just see see where people prefer. 
I, no. I mean, I would not go to that theater. No. Great. That would be, so it would be, why not? You wouldn't go to a theater that <laughs> had a couple screens open for open no, seating? No, no, I, I wouldn't go to the specific screens that are open seating. So you it, hated it. Back in the day, you're like, oh, oh this is the worst. I, I hate I, this. I never knew how early to get to the theater. So I would either get like too early. You got to plan ahead. Right. Or <laughs> no, you couldn't. You could. That's the thing. You couldn't plan ahead. Either, that's part so of the either, excitement of it. I would, it was not exciting. It's nerve wracking. <laughs> <laughs> what? 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 It's like, it, it, you know how long it took me to get on board with Southwest and this whole like you get in line. Like I, I'm down with it now. But those first times I flew to Southwest, I'm like, what do you mean? I don't have the assigned seat. I have to wait in the line. This is <laughs> yeah. not cool, people. But as you got acclimated to it, you're down with it now. You see well, the value. Because, but even, even Southwest isn't a free-for-all. They still put you, like, in an order. So, you you know, yeah. they're not just, like, opening the doors and say, yeah, all the right, order, The order you it. arrive. If theaters were like, um, we're going to keep the doors locked until this show is about to start <laughs> and everyone just runs in mad dash, I wouldn't like that. Okay. <laughs> that would not be my preference. But, but no, uh, but Southwest is routinely. Have but they don't open airplanes an hour in advance and you just kind of show up when you want to and find a seat. I don't. Southwest is like what the highest rated airline, isn't it? Yeah, but even they have a system. Like they're still not letting <laughs> just anyone on who just wants to find a seat they want. Like, yeah, uh, yeah. You uh, have to yeah have a James, you're, you're shaking right. your head. Southwest is one of the highest rated customer satisfaction. People was. love Southwest. They yeah. are. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. What is the competition like? United? No, no way. <laughs> Delta. <laughs> no. Who wants to fly American? I don't know. I don't. I, I don't fly it enough, obviously. I, don't. I mean, you could go some international airlines that are obviously higher rated, but I think in America you got JetBlue and Southwest or yeah. in Alaska maybe. Those are the highest rated. That's my yeah. gut. I thought JetBlue and Southwest were like the budget. Their budget, yeah. Yeah. So why? Like I've flown Delta before. De- flying Delta is great. Why would you no, no. have a problem with Delta? Delta, American United, people have terrible experiences with routinely. They're awful. Well, I and don't fly much, more. but when I do, uh, I fly, uh, oh, what's that? Uh, Allegiant. <laughs> so, Allegiant. Oh, uh, Allegiant? Yeah. yeah. Allegiant. 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 They charge you for napkins and stuff like that. What is, oh, no, I hate those, <laughs> man. But, okay, so I, I, Zach knows the story. Spirit I flew, Air. Front, flew Frontier once. To uh-huh. go see Zach. And it was one of the worst flights there and back. <laughs> I will not fly Frontier. We we had to, when we landed in Orlando, we couldn't disembark because they had to bring the cops on to arrest some drunk lady at the back of the plane. I, uh, say, that, like, yeah. I say that every time I fly Allegiant. And then uh, the next time I go to fly, I'm like, hmm, Delta for $400 or Allegiant, Allegiant for 59 yeah. yeah. Yeah, but... I guess okay. I'm going Allegiant again. <laughs> you, you pay the 59 Allegiant, right? But then you're checking a bag. Like, it adds up. I, I, w- I don't check With bags. Frontier, I, I didn't find it bags. that much cheaper once, like, the, that initial price is like, oh, wow, this is so much cheaper. And then they're like, oh, you want to have a seat? Well, here's some money for that. You want a seat belt? Okay. You want to bring, <laughs> like, a bag that's larger than a small mini purse? Well, that's going to cost some money, too. And by the time all those fees added up, it wasn't that much cheaper than if I had just flown Southwest or one of those other ones. <laughs> well, I remember machine, we don't play those fees. <laughs> and I was in a crappy seat with drunk people who couldn't even like. And this is this is people yelling at flight attendants pre-pandemic. <laughs> I remember like so. four or five years ago, I flew a plane, not personally, but I was on a plane <laughs> that flew from Stockholm to London, and I paid thirteen dollars for that flight, and that was literally a bus in the air. Like, was that Ryanair? It was Ryanair. Oh, yeah. It, it was literally like those bus seats without the padding, like the scoop bus seats that kind of feel like uh, the seat, the chairs you would sit in in middle school type of thing. Yeah. <laughs> it was like literally no padding on them. I was like, this is amazing. You could literally just hose down this place. <laughs> <laughs> they it was like do. no cloth. <laughs> um. When I was in my early 20s, I flew to um, the Dominican Republic for $16 on Spirit Air. Mm -hmm. And uh, I thought that was awesome. And then on the the flight back, we're on the runway and they said, this flight is probably going to get canceled. 
<laughs> and the next flight out on Spirit Air is a week from today. <laughs> oh so God. we'll book you on that flight. <laughs> but Wait, it so did end, it did end up going. You're you're but, already on the plane. Yeah. Ha- has it taxied from the jetway? Yeah, we weren't at the jet. No, they don't get a jetway. You have to pay money to use the jetway. So okay, they, so so you walked, walked across the tarmac. Yeah. You went up the, yeah. st- the staircase. Had yeah. the staircase been pulled away from the plane? Yeah. Oh yeah. We had the doors were closed. Some, yeah. And they're and they like, said, oh, by oh, the way, we're gonna cancel this flight on you. Yeah. After like an hour of sitting <laughs> on the you're runway. Sitting on. <laughs> yeah. Jesus. And I had called in sick to work. Um, for the three days that I was in the Dominican Republic. <laughs> yeah. And so I didn't have any plausible explanation <laughs> if i would to miss more days of work <laughs> you're like man, if only there was like a pandemic some disease i could oh, have that could yeah, work for two weeks <laughs> not not back then all right guys um, <laughs> well thanks for listening to this episode <laughs> yeah we we do have a topic for this week that does not include whatever we've been talking about are so we like far. 40 minutes into the episode <laughs> we are absolutely something like 40 that. minutes into okay. the episode so we and should just, probably get to it so this I, show is about an hour or so check okay i just want to say if i had prepared some intro we would not be here right now like yeah. this is totally organic so we, you, I, I, so i think it's also think nonsense is, so let's yeah this <laughs> is this is an argument for uh just you know hey and see where it goes Oh my gosh! <laughs> I yeah, I can imagine a world where you could prepare at least the bare minimum, and we could still have a good time talking. <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll work on the bare minimum, guys. Jeez, fine. All right, so forty minutes in, let's do some housekeeping. There's a video version of this podcast on YouTube. Go check it out uh, at Cinerealis. You could also follow us on Patreon at patreon.com slash Cinerealis. Get extra after show audio. Uh, amongst other bonuses over there. You could also leave us an Apple Podcast review on Apple Podcasts. We appreciate all of those, five stars only, or send us a listener email to heyguys at cinerealist.com. Let us know uh, what you like about the podcast, what you don't like. If you got a question for us, you could send that over or a top 10 list related or unrelated to something we've talked about on the podcast. We always love reading those from listeners or you could just weigh in on the delta versus southwest feud this we just started a few minutes ago um never flown southwest so i couldn't i have no you haven't no what i just haven't i don't know what to tell you wow okay um (laughs) speaking of listener emails we've gotten a couple lately and so we're going to talk about them on the podcast and discuss them right now. Uh, who wants to go first? I'll go. All right. I'll start with a quick one. And uh, the topic of this one is a quick thank you. All right. Hey guys, hope you're doing great. A quick thank you for these recommendations. One, the spine of night was a gem. We need more animation like this. Have so you, what, you guys checked it this? out yet? I think oh, you've this, talked about it, but give me a context. Oh, so this is from Stan, by the oh, way. Oh, this is with Xena Warrior Princess, right? Yes, with Lucy, Law- with Lucy Lawless. Yeah, this is a animated in the rotoscope style movie where you have actors and then you trace over their actions and you know to make animation. And it's a it's a an epic fantasy movie, um, definitely for adults. And yeah, it's a movie that I think I've watched. Or I know I've watched. I'm not sure if either of you guys have seen it. it. I think it made my top 20 of 2021. And it's uh, it's a cool watch. It's worth checking out. So I'm glad that Stan was able to enjoy it. Where is that? Online? Uh, I bl- yes, it is online. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> have you guys seen The Scanner Darkly? The um, Yeah. Well, who's that? Oh, what's that guy's name? Richard Linklater? Yeah. Seen it. I own it. There's nothing oh. quite like the crystal clear picture quality of Blu-ray. I'm guessing you own it on Blu-ray. I do. I own it on Blu-ray. <laughs> you really put that together. <laughs> wow. Uh, yes, I mean, so that's another one. So, Stan, if you're looking for more animation like The Spine of Night, check out A Scanner Darkly. A Scanner I mean, Darkly, Scanner was, Darkly th- was okay. A Scanner Darkly is awesome. You're crazy. Just okay. No, no. What's a better one? <laughs> What's the better, the better yeah, rotoscope the better, one? The Waking better Life. Richard Linkletter one? Yeah, Waking Life. No, I, dis- oh, I disagree. Waking Waking Life is 
perfectly watchable, but uh, Scanner Darkly goes places. <sighs> Scanner Darkly was meandering. No, Waking Life is meandering. It's it's a <laughs> it's a it's a documentary that's rotoscoped. It's like rotoscope talking heads. Sweet. And no, I like like documentaries. Scanner Darkly is a movie about drugs and trips, and it, so it uses the rotoscope, the use of the animation to then enhance you know, with all these trippy images what's going on to the characters. <sighs> Look, Waking Life has Waking its Life place. just gives you Alex we, Jones. We don't we don't have to put down Waking Life to no. enjoy Scanner Darkly. Okay. <laughs> <We> <laughs> they're both they're both good in their own right. But Scanner Darkly is more my type of movie than Waking Life. Like just the content of it. Scanner Darkly worked for me better. But um the cast of Scanner Darkly is amazing. Like Keanu Reeves, Robert Downey Jr., Woody Harrelson, Winona Ryder, all star cast. And interesting trippy visuals. Yeah. One of the first movies that I remember watching Robert Downey Jr. in and thinking, oh, I guess he's back. Because he was gone for like a decade from major motion pictures. Yep. How much money was, do you think Scanner Darkly made at the box office? Oh, 37 13 million. million. I heard 13. Who said 13? I said 13. James, or Zach said 13. And Kyle said what? 37. 8.7. Ooh. Zach wins. Not, not exactly a huge hit. I was one of those 8.7. Me too. Yeah. I saw it at uh, Enzion because nobody you know, else had I wanna, it. You know, I want to see a movie about drugs that doesn't have trippy visuals. That's such a cliche at this point. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I mean, they do have that. Like, not, um, I guess Reckoning for a Dream has trippy visuals. It does. Sure. I'm sure there are movies Fear about drugs where there is not crazy things on screen. You're just watching people suffering from drugs. <laughs> like, you, you want to watch Shame, but for drugs. Yeah. <laughs> I just like, oh, trippy visuals for a drug movie. Okay. Okay. Well, <laughs> I, I bet there's good music. You just want to see Misery <laughs> instead. I didn't yeah, know this. I but the uh, the executive producers on um, Scanner Darkly were Steven Soderbergh and George Clooney. Did not know they were involved with the movie at all. I believe that. Oh, it's got Clooney's thumbs all over it. <laughs> sure, it does. Cl- Clooney, the the savior of rotoscoping. <laughs> Uh, all right, Stan has a second recommendation, or thank you for recommendation. The second one is New Order, which, James, I think you talked about. Yeah. Uh, he said this was insanely brutal, but he dug it. Uh, there's a very thin line between order and collapse. The world can turn upside down so quickly, it's scary. Watching this at the cinema in a mall was a surreal experience. Yeah, I bet. It's very realistic. Like, it's... um. It doesn't go like as big as a mall type of thing, but the way you can just be living normal life and then like, you know, it's that movie about, uh, takes place in Mexico where the, the wealth gap between the poor and the rich comes to a boiling point. And so the poor just start, you know, looting everything and invading rich spaces, I would say, and just killing all the rich people. And um, yeah, it's a brutal movie, but uh, good <laughs> if you're prepared for what the movie's going to dish out. Made my uh, top 20 of the year. Yeah. Nice. That's from Stan in Romania. So Stan in Romania, thanks for writing in. Yeah, absolutely. All right. I've got a last 10 top 10 from Troy. All right. All right. Uh, he says, as usual, I love the top 20 of 2021 and hangover episodes. I'm definitely one of the people who spent 1% of their year listening to you three. <laughs> Thank you, Troy, for doing that. Uh, his number 10 is Hamlet from 1948. He gave it one star. Mm-hmm. Not a fan of that. Then he, his number nine jumps up to three and a half stars. <laughs> it's a huge leap. <laughs> yeah. So Hamlet was a low point for him, for sure. Uh, these are almost all... Uh, best picture winners. Oh yeah, there's a ton in here. 
Although the movie we're going to talk about today, Lost Daughter, he gave three and a half stars as his number seven. And his number one is Lost Weekend, which gave four and a half stars. Um, and that's a movie I liked quite a bit, too. It's about alcoholism. It's really good. Lost Although Weekend has a, it. Lost Weekend has a, fav- a famous director, right? Um, like Bergman yeah, or something. It's not Bergman, but I'm sure it's it is a um, director. another Italian or Frenchman, Billy Wilder, or Billy Wilder, <laughs> who's your neither Kyle's, Italian. Kyle's or... like second favorite director. <laughs> <laughs> I was confusing that with like La Ventura. Who's the guy who did La Ventura? I don't know. Uh, Antonioni, and, uh, huh? Antonioni, Antonioni, and doesn't doesn't he have a movie that was it's kind of actual lost? It's like a half movie that's out there. There's a movie called Weekend. That's what I'm thinking of. Sure. Yeah. Which, yeah. That's not Antonioni. Okay. But who's that? Fritz Lang. No. <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking. Um, I want to say Godard, but I, I yeah. don't think it's. Okay. I so I here's thinking. how I got there. So there's a movie called Weekend directed by Godard, who's French. And I'm, isn't like half the footage of Weekend missing? Is this a kind of a lost movie? No. Okay. I'm thinking something else then. So that, that, I thought that was my connection of Lost Weekend, French person. Hmm. I don't know. Thanks, Troy. Always love reading your um, last ten top tens, and especially because like I've seen a lot of movies on your last ten top ten. Like for instance, Gabe Muti on the Bounty, four stars. That's a movie Kyle's been championing, so I need to rewatch this thing. No, 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 no. I've been I've been championing the K Mutiny. Oh, not Mutiny on the Bounty. I've never seen Mutiny on the Bounty. Well, it's four stars, man. Another big surprise. Isn't that um? Uh, oh, I did. I did it, Zach. I tapped the table. Yeah, I, I hear it. Okay, you can carry it away. Carry it away. <laughs> oh, Mutiny on the that, Bounty is like a real it's a, thing. It's like a Clark Gable movie. I thought it was. Um, oh, it's a Brando the, movie. The Brando. That's what I'm trying. The name I was trying to go for. It's a very early Brando, isn't it? Brando's in Mutiny on the Bounty. Well, there's definitely a Mutiny on the Bounty from 1962 and one from 1935. Okay, so he's in the 62. This is the 35. Okay. 1935 is Clark Gable. You're right. So the 1935 one is better than the 1960-something one? Uh, Probably not. Maybe, but it won Best Picture, I think, right? Mm. No? I don't know. I'd be I don't know. I'd be more likely to watch the Brando one because it's not as old. <laughs> That's a, yes, that is an interesting reason to pick between old movies, but yeah. I mean, 19, I th- 1962 is like, at least it's in color. Is it? Yeah. Yeah, it's in okay. color. Okay. It was a box office failure. According to Wikipedia. Okay. I have another email here in front of me. Let's hear it. What do you got? What do you got? This one's from David English. All right. David goes on to write, Hey guys, liked your remarks on the pig underground restaurant fight club and thought your reasoning for its existence was pretty darn plausible. And then I read this interview blurb from IndieWire that confirms your theory. Just an FYI. Then he has a link. It's HTTPS colon four. No. <laughs> he has a link to the, uh, to the, the uh, article, but he did leave a snippet. So I'm going to read this quick snippet. So the question is from the, uh, from the, uh, the writer. I was unaware of Portland under, I was unaware of a Portland underworld of chef boxing. Where did that stem from? And then the person be interviewed who I'm guessing is a director or producer possibly writer someone on the on the production crew they wrote um i hope that's not real it stemmed from a combination of things people who work in restaurants do tend to get abused and exhausted on location trips we checked out restaurants in portland and talked to a chef what do you do to unwind after work there was a lot of stress there i really like punching a bag they are abused all day by higher ups and customers how do you want to take it out and feel powerful somewhere how do you get a sense of control over your inner lives in the face of powerlessness or grief? It made sense that lower level restaurant people come here to use what they had to get power and control. There are underground tunnels in Portland, which had a lot of organized crime in the 50s. It has a storied underground history. And so, yeah, did, did all three of us think that that was some sort of underground fight club or Zach, were you the, the outlier on that? I mean, it was obviously an underground fight club, right? Okay. They were yeah. underground and fighting each other. Okay, mm-hmm. yes. 
I, I don't, I, there's probably some disagreement about like, I guess if that was real or if, or if the bosses, the chefs come knowing that they're going to get beat up and they just take it for oh. as long as they can. Yes, or if it's like, was, you're trying to win. That's right. That I, my interpretation was that the chef just takes a beating. Well, I yeah, mean, he I, definitely takes a beating, but I, in the fight before him, it wasn't just a guy taking a beating. It was like two people fighting each other. Okay, I, yeah, I don't remember, I don't remember yeah. that as well. So, yeah. yeah. And he just takes a beating for no reason. No, we're not, we've had this discussion. It's not for no reason. <laughs> and James is going to have it again. Why didn't he fight back? <laughs> to prove. Was, was there any benefit to not fight back? Because it's the anti-John Wick, Zach. We've talked about this. He, no, no, he doesn't. Oh, you expect him to fight back, right? Because that's maybe there's what a screen. Was... Maybe there's a screenplay reason for him to not fight back. But like for that character, what's his motivation to not write back? He's thinking, I don't want people to think I'm John Wick. No, he's not a fighter. He's not a fighter. Period. For all you know, he's a pacifist. <laughs> he never strikes another person through the entire movie. He might have been a hundred percent a pacifist and you, you don't know. He's just, he needs the information he needs. The only way he's going to get it without beating a guy evidently is to just take it until the guy gives him the money. Not money, but you know, info in this case. It's civil disobedience. Yeah. And it has dual purpose, right? On one side, you're like, holy crap, this guy is so awesome. He is just going to take a beating from this guy and not fight back, even though he could, because at that point you're thinking this is John wick with a pig. And then later on you realize, no, he's just a chef. He's not John wick. He couldn't have beat that guy even if he wanted to. So he did what he had to do to get the information so he could get his pig back. Even if it meant taking a beating. In that case, why did he head. just, why didn't he fall to the ground sooner? Why did he why did he stand up and take hits? Why didn't he because, just like lay on the ground in a fetal position? Because if he flop, there's no respect out of flopping. Yeah, and like, he has to he, convince he's to the, the guy. He's trying to earn the respect of the room. He's trying to convince the guy to give him the information. The guy says you got to fight. So he's like, "Okay." And then he fights. The guy he, didn't say you have to fight. I don't remember. I don't remember but, what he says. Remember that scene in Cool Hand Luke when Cool Hand Luke gets in a fight and he gets beaten and he falls to the ground and stays down there crying and everyone you know, applauds him and he becomes popular in the prison? No. No, because he gets back up and takes the beating and that's how he earns the respect <laughs> of everyone around him. Um, yeah. Take his no Cool Hand Luke. You know, Paul Newman just curls up in the fetal position <laughs> waiting for it to stop. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, yeah. Thanks, David. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the email. Yeah. <laughs> so, the, so really the, the summary of that email is it doesn't really exist, but there was a path to the person who wrote pig imagining this thing into existence. R right. They're, they're taking Portland's history. They're taking the stress of being a restaurant, restaurant employee, plus, especially, you know, being a server or front of house, something like that. Mm -hmm. And then imagining a situation where a fight club could grow out of that. I feel bad for these real life Portland waiters and, and, you know, front of house staff, like it's they're not this just, stressed out. It's not just Portland. It's yeah. So Megan, I mean, my relax, wife, relax people. She, no, it's, that's not rest. <laughs> have you worked in a restaurant? Yeah. I, I've you ever heard worked that, in a restaurant. I've worked in three restaurants. Okay. Okay. Have you worked in like not a Denny's, but like a real restaurant? Oh, ouch. What, what, what's the difference <laughs> and, stress level? And, and I, I, just, just before I put my foot in my mouth, <laughs> it's very stressful for Denny's employees too, I'm sure. I was going to say, I, I can imagine the clientele is very different I, and you'd I have different challenges. Like, but yeah. if you're, if you're front of house staff, do you want to deal with someone at a Hyatt restaurant customer or the type of person that comes to a Denny's at, <laughs> at midnight? Um, I think it's really stressful for the kitchen staff, but if we're talking about like the wait staff. Why oh. is it that stressful for them? Have you have you been a waiter? Yes, at three restaurants. Well, uh, maybe you have just you, managed James, stress have easily. You? Yeah, have I you did been it at Pizza a waiter? Hut. I did it. You were a waiter Hut. at Pizza Hut. 
I was not. I was a cook that occasionally had to be a waiter because our waiters would call in sick, and it was stressful for me. Because the waiters were stressed, mm. so they didn't come to work. James, was it stressful just because you didn't do it very often, and so like you felt like a fish out of water when you had to? Maybe. Yeah. And also, like you just have to think of a hundred things at once. Maybe you get used to that if you do it a bunch, but um, I found it stressful. I think the I think I mean, it's more stressful. Not in the like kitchen. I want to beat somebody's face in stressful. <laughs> but <laughs> Kyle, what's your wife's experience? So she was a, uh, a a chef, a baker at a restaurant in Madison. It was a high end restaurant, and it was a very stressful experience for her. She worked there for nine months, and it's crazy hours. It's a lot of demands from customers and from people you know who she worked for. And I could, you know, obviously she didn't want to resort to a fight club about it, but I, I could <laughs> definitely see the stress among her and her employees or her and her coworkers and ways they tried to alleviate that stress, like, you know, going out to a bar or something like that. So totally. people are Again, definitely like, trying to find ways to get out of it. I think being a chef or a line cook or anything like that it just is the worst. There's so many demands on you and you can only go so fast and you're being asked to do twice but, as much as you actually can. Same for a waiter. Like you can only go so fast. You have to cover multiple tables. People are expecting your like if anything goes wrong at a restaurant, people respond to their waiter. Whether the whether the waiter is responsible for that thing going wrong or not, the first thing is they talk to the waiter and say, My food's bad, my food's cold, this is wrong. And then the waiter has to then either deal with that um incident in the moment or then they need to find the appropriate person to help that customer out but they're like the they're the front line to any customer issue within the restaurant no no i i totally agree with you again i've been that person at three different restaurants how many restaurants i forget kyle did you say you've worked at oh i've worked at zero but i've yelled at a lot of waiters <laughs> no, just i just have never i just feel bad for these people in portland that feel like they want to punch punch back after because i just never felt that I don't think it's a Portland thing. I think it's a restaurant thing. Gotcha. Yeah. So, and and the fact that you didn't have that experience is great. Or maybe you were a terrible waiter who just didn't care. <laughs> and like, people are like, we're, if my food's cold. You're like, ah, it's nice. Okay. Thanks. Those are the two options. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> your two <laughs> options are you are terrible at your job or everyone was nice to you. <laughs> it's amazing. All right. I think we had one more. We do. We do. Uh, this one is from Emily. Hi, James, Zach, and Kyle. Hope you are doing well. Thanks for your Cinerealist podcast each week. They are so great. I listened to all of episode 512, the top 20 of 2021. I hadn't seen too many of your picks, but I was very excited that King Richard made number 19 for James. And mm. he said it felt he felt it was the feel-good movie of the year. I love that movie. Also, I was excited that Luca made Zach's list. I can't remember which number, but I love that movie also. And King Richard was an honorable mention for me as well. Yeah. And uh, I have a Luca theory for me. Okay. So okay. I've seen Luca twice. Mm -hmm. And I've fallen asleep. A double Luca? Both times during it. <laughs> okay. So have you seen it's... the end of Luca? No, no. I always fall asleep like 10 minutes in and then wake up 10 minutes later. 10 minutes so, in? <laughs> so that sounds like a I, you problem. So you I haven't realized, seen minute 10 to 20 ever? I, like, I start the movie and they're in the water and then I fall asleep and then I wake up and there's kids running around who aren't in the water anymore. <laughs> and then I'm like, wait, what? I just like turn to my son or my wife and be like, what, what happened exactly? So... I like Luca, but maybe if I saw the entire movie, I would have a better, stronger feeling on it. That's funny. And that was also the experience I had before we reviewed it for the show. But I was <laughs> like, I couldn't. I'm like, I, I missed those 10 minutes, so I just got to kind of figure out what happened there. I think hmm. minutes 10 to 20 are strong. They're strong. Okay. So maybe that would like be a half star I'm missing right there in those 10 minutes. Could be. Okay. Could be. Um, she also included her, her last 10 top 10. Uh, she says um, she wanted us to see how many we've watched or heard of. Okay. She okay. says my movie taste is a bit different than yours. So thanks for the show. So here's our last 10 top 10. You guys chime in if you have seen or heard of the movies on her list. Okay. Okay. Whoever has seen or heard of the most wins. 
If you've seen it, two points. If you've heard of it, one point. Okay. Number 10, love and basketball. Seen it. I've seen it. I've heard of it. Is that Leo DiCaprio? No. No. No, that's basketball. That's the basketball diaries. <laughs> but I still know this movie though. Uh, are you I've sure? Heard of it. I've heard of it. I don't Who's in it? You've heard the title. Who's in it? Uh I believe in this case it's an African American cast. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it is. Okay. Yeah. James and I have two points. You have one point. Number nine, <laughs> saved by Grace. Heard of it. Uh the concept or this movie? <laughs> no, the movie. Okay. Uh, number eight, break every chain. Number I, seven. I haven't heard yeah. of that, but I'm pretty sure it's a saved guy by grace situation. <laughs> yeah, I would imagine. Number seven, a match made at Christmas. Do, I mean, is that a Hallmark a, movie or a Lifetime movie? It's such a generic title. I want to say I've heard of it. Yeah. But um, number six, Joe Bell. Joe Bell. Oh, I, is this about Tinkerbell's dad? I don't know. Is it? I feel like I've heard of that. Hold on. Okay. Let me look at it. Are up. you thinking of Joe Dirt? No, no, it, it's the combination of the two. It's Tinkerbell had a really trashy upbringing. It's her trying to get out of it. He's gonna love it. it. This yeah. is a 2020 film. Um, yeah, yeah, I've heard of this. It's a um, I may have seen this. Joe have Bell. you seen Joe Bell? What's Joe Bell about? Uh, it's um, Mark Wahlberg and uh, I have not seen this, but I have definitely heard of it. If you look at the poster for Joe Bell and then you look at the poster for that Matt Damon movie where he Yeah, is, they're very similar. <laughs> the posters still are water. very similar and they both came out like yeah, in still 2021. Water. Oh wow. Um uh number 5 same time next Christmas? No. Number nope. 4 time is up. Yeah. Number 3 I've never heard, heard of that. Okay. I think that's also a faith-based possibly I don't know. Okay. Number you three. Think they wanted to call their movie Time's Up and then realize, oh, wait, we can't do that. Yeah, uh, it has nothing to do with that. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, number three, Wonder Woman 1984. Seen it. Seen, seen it. this one. Number two, The Princess and the Frog. Seen it. Seen it. it. And number one, Encanto. Seen it. Seen it. Seen it. All right, James wins. You have the most similar movie taste to Emily. Nice. Um, there's so many Christmas movies that come out nowadays. I don't know how anybody makes any money off of them. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, there's literally like 40 every year. Every streaming service has like five new Christmas movies every year. And they're all just like, at least from perception of somebody who's never watched them, they all seem to be exactly the same mix of the same like 10 qualities you know what i mean like they might mix and match this element or that element but they're all just like the same ingredients i think it's a ritual for a lot of families mm -hmm. to just whatever the new christmas movies are you watch them hmm. and, and the think... fact that they're similar means it, yeah. it feels connected to previous years for you oh so it's by design that they're all similar. it feels comfortable yeah i yeah. think so I mean, I'm not looking for uncomfortable Christmas movies, but I <clears throat> cannot watch the same story with tiny variations over and over and over again. It's just, no, I'm not interested. I don't know okay. who is. I will shame them till the rest of my, for the rest of my <laughs> life. <laughs> Sounds like you're shaming Zach's sister. Here. They're probably oh, well. really cheap to make, too, I imagine. Because you're just like, We'll get a house. We'll film in it. We'll get a cast of people that uh, want to be famous but haven't quite quite got there and uh, oh. ready to go. <laughs> okay, so you've heard of such Luke. a cynical take on you've Christmas. heard of Luke Perry, right? Yeah, I've heard of Luke Perry. Like Luke Perry later in his career cranked out Hallmark movies, and it's because for that him, absolutely it makes sense. But okay, but like as a working actor, steady paycheck. Mm -hmm. Like he knows I'm every. You know, every two months I'm making a movie. I've got consistent work. I'm getting paid the same for every single one. Like sure. I, I can see right. Maybe as a as a viewer, I don't see the draw for it. But like for actors who like want to work and want consistent work, these lifetime Hallmark movies are great because they are constantly being made, and you can just get on that schedule and just keep making money, making movies. 
I don't have a problem. I don't have a problem with Luke Perry starring in uh, made for TV Christmas movies. That doesn't bother me at all. Like from an actor's perspective, you know, you do you. Um, I just can't watch them, I guess is what I'm saying. Do you guys remember when uh, Will Ferrell made a Hallmark movie? Yeah. I've always meant to watch it. Yeah. I mean, he really made a Hallmark movie. Like if you think Hallmark movies are nearly unwatchable, that's what he made. Because <laughs> it's he not did it straight, right? Yeah, it's not yeah. him doing a parody of a Hallmark yeah. movie, or you know what I mean. Like, there's not even a slight wink that this is ridiculous. He's just in a Hallmark movie. It's pretty crazy. It's him and um, Kristen Wiig, Julie Louis Dreyfus. Was it Kristen Wiig? I was thinking it was. Uh, oh, but it's Kristen Wiig. Yeah, it's a deadly adoption. Kristen Wiig. Okay. Kristen Wiig. Yeah. I mean, the only reason to watch that is to watch those two actors in a Hallmark movie. <laughs> but it's a Hallmark movie <laughs> that happens to have those two actors in it. Um, I heard, too, that when he originally did that, he, uh, ahead of time, like, I don't know if he put it in his contract. I don't, I don't think he actually put it in print, but he made it known that he literally wants no difference in how they treat him or Kristen. Like it was basically like, we're doing this. It has to be the exact same budget. You're giving us the exact same pay that you would have paid. And there's no difference on set. Like we get the same trailers. We're just people who are coming for a week to film this movie as if, you know, in your movie factory, basically. Why did he insist on the same trailers? Because he wanted the experience of being an actor that lives in existence that makes these movies like so he's like slumming it yeah it, it's like the song common people i guess <laughs> yeah he's, he's william shatner i don't remember <laughs> yeah. him saying it in those terms i think it was more like um he's just curious what this factory is compared to what he's used to okay yeah type of thing because they used to make like 40 a year which is insane if you think about it like one studio making 40 movies in a year with the same creative team. You know what I mean? Through all 40. <laughs> How, how'd you like to produce 40 movies at the same time? It's an insane, it's an insanely efficient yep. movie making well, machine. Basically. If you're making the same movie with slight variations every single time. Yeah. Probably. I mean, if it's a, it's like uh people who write, like the Jack Reacher books, for example, those kinds of things. Like you, you're, cra- you're writing the same book every year just with small changes to it and they would make um they would make movies from beginning to end in like 16 days and then they would if they needed an insert shot they would just pull it from some other movie that they shot (laughs) because they reuse sets and you know do whatever it takes to get the stories on on uh on print (laughs) so that they can move on to the next one anyway what were we talking about Oh, we were uh, reading uh, Emily's last in top ten. Okay, <laughs> and that was the end of it, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you everyone for sending us an email. Just a reminder: you too can send us an email, and we'll talk about it or around it, one or the other. Hey guys at cinerealist dot com. R double e with an L and then an S dot com. <laughs> we're gonna talk now about this movie this week's major <laughs> motion picture that we've seen is it a major motion picture when it's only direct to streaming it's a minor I, motion picture it's right? not a, a motion it's an picture. indie film it's not a major yeah. motion picture right. it's an indie film not a major motion picture i have been I mean, corrected spider-man does show up at the very end he does but we'll say that for the spoiler section for sure uh the movie we saw is on netflix right now they own it so it'll be there till the end of time. The movie's called The Lost Daughter. Here's a clip. So she's not calming down. Yeah. It's been a weird day. We found her and then she lost her doll. I used to have a doll like that. Called Mina. 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 Well, Minnie Mama, as my mother called her. You'll find it. Yeah. (laughs) 
sieht man. That was The Lost Daughter, starring Olivia Coleman, Dakota Johnson, Jesse Buckley, Paul Mescal, Ed Harris, amongst others. The official IMDb plot synopsis for The Lost Daughter is, A woman's beach vacation takes a dark turn when she begins to confront the troubles of her past. Pretty vague, but, you know decent plot description i would say i like it uh zach says uh major motion pictures major motion pictures have to have a budget of over five million dollars yeah that's what i read either um do you think they spent five million dollars on the lost daughter yes i mean so where what do you mean where they filmed it (laughs) at a tropical location That, that was the dingiest tropical location i think that was greece and they found like the dingiest beach, beach on Greece to film that. I don't know. I think you could have easily spent five million making this. Yeah, I'm sure. I don't think did. you spent ten, <laughs> but I think you maybe gave Olivia Coleman half a million, if not a million, for being in this. Like yeah, she's not Dakota she's a Johnson. Name. Yeah. Oh yeah. No, I, I, I Peter Sarsgaard, Ed names. Harris, yeah, Maggie Gyllenhaal. But you got to option I'll, the book. Oftentimes a lot of these actors will take scale or won't take a lot of money to make an independent film. If they're doing, if they're going for that prestige, this was a Netflix movie. Yeah. It's not an independent film. Okay. Netflix got money out the wazoo. Well, (laughs) did Netflix produce this or did Netflix buy it after the fact? That's a good question that I don't that's, bought a, that's your difference between a kind of Netflix movie. Okay, so it's not a Netflix it produced. It's not like Red Notice or something like that. Yeah, but Maggie Gyllenhaal is directing this. She knows it's going to get bought up. Um, first played September 3rd, 2021 by August. Wait, September comes after August. Uh, Netflix bought the rights in 2021 in August. Okay. Evidently, it played in a bunch of uh, film festivals. Yeah, before August. So, um, yeah, so it's an independent film that Netflix purchased. Yes. So it's an independent film. In summary, okay. yes. it had to have a budget of less than twenty-two million to be considered for a uh, festival it was in. So it's somewhere between zero and 22, 22 million. million. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Perfect. We're by the end of this podcast, we'll have it narrowed down. We'll really know. <laughs> <laughs> what if we had a podcast? Like what if our podcast was every, we pick a movie and we just detective our way to a budget number. And that was what every episode was. But we can't like Google it. Right. We have to try and figure out. We just add up all the scenes, what we think it would cost. I mean, there are people whose job it is to like read a script and then of figure course. out how much this is going to cost. And that's, yeah. uh, I think, a limited audience for a podcast, probably. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. So The Lost Daughter, based on a book, um, optioned directly by Maggie Gyllenhaal, who decided that this was going to be her feature film directing debut uh maggie gyllenhaal famous actress sister of jake gyllenhaal isn't there a third gyllenhaal that's like in movies or are those the only two it'd be news to me Hmm. i know of maggie and jake all right anyway um (laughs) so the lost daughter i saw it like a month ago (laughs) so my (laughs) My memory isn't super clear on the specific details, uh, but I am curious to know what you guys thought about it. I think I had it on my um, honorable mentions when we went through 2021 top 20 lists, uh, and I enjoyed that means I enjoyed it. What did you guys think of The Lost Daughter? I don't hear what Zach has to say. <laughs> Zach's going. First. I li- I enjoyed it quite a bit. I liked it a lot. Okay. Oh, I I didn't care for it. Oh really? <laughs> yeah, I didn't care for it. 
Um, I'm sensing a pattern here. <laughs> <laughs> There's only two in a row. <laughs> <laughs> two is a pattern. <laughs> which uh, which minutes of the film did you sleep during? Uh, none of them, but I wish I'd fall asleep during it. <laughs> I, wow, it, so I, you were actually bored by it. It's not that you it, didn't like it. It's that you were bored by it. Well, it, I, di- I did find the pacing to be quite slow. So that was part of it. Like um, about halfway through, Megan and I paused to like get popcorn or something. And we didn't realize it was only halfway through. Like we paused the movie and we saw how much time was left. Like that's only half the movie. So hmm. it, it, was, it was dragging for me. Um, and then... We can we can kind of get into it, but I found the Olivia Coleman character, both her portrayal and the Jesse Buckley tra- portrayal, um, just such an unsympathetic character that I just really I I didn't really care about her and what she was doing on screen, both as the younger version and as the older version, just annoyed me. Hmm. And I, I was not able to. I, I know the movie was trying to get me to see things through her eyes, um, but I just wasn't on board with the character because I found them so unsympathetic. I got you. I think for me, I think they presented her. She's our protagonist, right? Yeah. And then obviously she has uh, a lot of qualities that um, we're not sympathetic towards. And I thought that the movie did a really good job of creating this complex character, right? That had um, this mix of of decisions and pasts and uh, things about her that are reprehensible, uh, but things about her that are um, admirable. It was just, it, it just made for a complex character that I was interested in watching on screen. And, and I found it interesting that the movie both did not go out of its way to judge her, but also didn't go out of the way to um, protect her either. And um, I think if the movie had judged her, it, it still could have been a compelling film for me. But if the movie had protected her, I think I would have been turned off by the movie. But I don't. I, it didn't. It didn't feel like it had to do that, and I I was happy about that decision as well. And then the movie is is just chalked full of like little narrative symbolic touches that I thought helped elevate the film a little bit. Just all these little things that um, don't have maybe specific meanings, but like have a vibe to them that like really add to the kind of like, you know, vibe of the film, which I appreciated a lot. The, The vibe added to the vibe. No, just like all these little sy- symbolic moments okay. that overall created a, a like a patina to the film's, you know, vibe. <laughs> uh, can, can, without spoiling, I, I'm just curious, like, can you give an example of one of those to see if something that maybe I missed? Yeah. So when she goes to get the fruit um, in her apartment and she picks it up and she picks up one and it's rotten in the bottom, yeah. like it looks like it's fine on top, but in the bottom it's rotten. And then she picks up another fruit and it's rotten on the bottom as well. You know, it just like something under the surface is rotten there. Um, when to the outside observer, everything seems fine for really speaks to like what motherhood was for her. Right. Mm-hmm. The, the older lady that's pregnant, she's like, Oh, you could never, you know, you can never not like being around your child. And she's like, Oh, is that your experience from the outside? You know, when the, when the pine cone fell on her as she's walking away from the beach, just these little things that like just for me perked my ears up a little bit every time they happen. I was like, oh, okay, there's, there's a, uh, a second kind of subliminal level to this film that um, I just want to keep taking mental notes about. And I really like the ending. I, I thought the ending was kind of just, uh, yeah, a straight drama doesn't give us an ending like this. Um, I've, and I I appreciated the ending like this. I found the ending left field. Okay. And I found uh I found Olivia Coleman's reaction before the ending happened to be unrealistic. Be, just because of, of what she did earlier in the movie and then when she tries to make up for it, of course people are going to be mad about that. 
that, yeah, that, but I think that's what's the what was mo- more interesting. The most interesting thing about the movie to me was just her difference in perception of, of what people thought about yeah. certain things. You know but, what I mean? Yeah, but I, see, okay, so she does something. The Leva Coleman character does something mm-hmm. that causes another family pain, right? Sure. Yeah. But she, and then she spends the next four or five days seeing this family in pain. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like she, she has to know that her action is the reason for this family's pain. Right. Of course. So then when she tries to fix that pain and the family reacts the way they do, why is she shocked by that? Well, so here's what's going on, and I don't have to spoil it to talk about it. Okay, she's a she's a uh, essentially selfish person. Yeah, right. Yep. Mm-hmm. A lot of her decisions are made out of self centered selfishness. Okay. At the end of the film, she has this moment for her. It's a breakthrough where she empathizes with this other person and decides, "I'm going to do a selfless act." Right, uh, owning up to something. Mm-hmm. Um, but because she's still a selfish person, she thinks that just because she has gone through this emotional experience and come to an emotional conclusion that other people have as well or will accept it for for as such. Um, and so she's blinded by that. So she is le- legitimately making an unselfish dis- like uh, gesture, but her own selfishness is blinded to the fact that it's not going to be taken as that. Mm-hmm. And so for me, it just it just added to the complexity, the nuance of the character in a way that I appreciated. Like I, I felt it was motivated, but um, I'm glad it played out that way, you know, because otherwise it would be giving her passes that she didn't deserve. Yeah. Yeah. I thought it was, I thought like of a lot of performances I've seen this year, the central character in this movie played by Olivia Coleman is probably the most complicated presentation of a person i saw all year like i'm i'm not the the movie wasn't like there for me like in a top 20 kind of way but olivia coleman's the execution of what they put on screen was totally believable and at times revolting and at times you felt pity for this person and at times you um were confused by her choices and things like that but i absolutely believe that um that she is a person who had a complicated experience being a mother. <laughs> you know what I mean? And she, it's, it's a hard balance to pull off to have somebody who um, loves her children and yet can't stand elements of them. <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? Is literally driven away by them, especially when a- they were young kids that, who can't control how annoying they're being type of thing but it got to the point where they weren't even being annoying they're just being endearing the fact that they existed yeah (laughs) it snowballed from like the fact that they existed was annoying and the fact that she knows that that's not the right attitude to have to be annoyed by your kids just for existing and her only option in her mind was to change the situation and um the presentation of all of those things is just not something you see in a movie much because it is a hard person to root for like the mother who hates her kids. That kind of mother character we just don't see in movies. Yeah. But that's a real mother character or a part of every mother. Yeah. I mean, normally when these type of topics are in movies, they're horror movies. (laughs) You know what I mean? And the kid is an actual terror or the mother is an actual terror. And this was like, um, I would say occasionally flirting with being a horror movie, just in like the dread nest, the dread that the movie kind of like plays with over the course, uh, both with her and her relationship with her children and family members, but also, um, this kind of looming other family that you don't know much about the mystery uh-huh. of the other family. But I, I thought, um, I thought that was pretty unique and well executed if only because it's kind of an impossible thing to execute in a way where everybody's going to enjoy it. (laughs) You know what I mean? Like it's not, uh, there's just some movies that, um, are not made for everybody. And I can imagine 
some people watching this movie and just being completely turned off by her. There's no redeemingness to it. Um, and I wouldn't blame them. I think that's the camp I'm in. I was just so turned off by the character. I, I had no problem with the acting, no problem with the performances. Sure. Directing wise, I mean, no, no, there's really not much to say about directing. It was fine, in my opinion. Um, but the character just turned me off so much that I, 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 didn't, I didn't buy in. Sure. Sure. Have you guys ever been annoyed with your children? <laughs> yeah, of, course. of course. Yes. <laughs> my daughter bit me yesterday. Enough. Oh, is, she, is she in biting phase? Oh, yeah. Oh, that's fun. Yeah. Enough to like be like, I got to go take a car ride for a minute. <laughs> no. Or like a walk around the house or something. No, but oh, I, there's I'm sure there's definitely times where you're like, ah, I'm gonna take a little space away. Yeah, that, like sure. there's times I'll be like, I'm going to the other room now. Like you're gonna be in here. You might be mad that I'm leaving, but I'm gonna go to the other room because we need to take a breath here. I think the most believable thing in that movie was the first time we see young Olivia Coleman as a mother, mm-hmm. and her daughters are playing, and she's laying on her back on the floor just kind of ignoring them because oh, yeah. she's so exhausted. <laughs> Every parent at some point has just laid on the ground next to their plain kid. Uh, and, just, yeah. and they just kind of play around you. And you're yeah, just, exactly. You just have like to be in the room. In a daze. It's like, we're going to play dead body. I'm going to lay here. You just move my arms around. I'll do what you want, but I'm going to lay here the whole time. Yeah. yeah hmm. and, but, you know, then, of course, like, you know, like, we'll, we'll, I'll, we'll when Galen was younger, like, we'll play sleeping. And 10 seconds later, he's, like, jumping on my face. Like, okay, we're not playing sleeping anymore. I'm like, no, no, no. <laughs> so we're still playing. Um, there's only there was only one time with Zach that I was I'm a pretty James's patient, son. I'm a pretty pa- patient person. Yeah, Zach, my son, uh, who's been on the podcast before. Yeah, uh, named after me. I don't remember how old he was, but there's only one time where he's <laughs> seriously annoyed me. I hope he listens to this. Um and it was actually right here in this room behind that door, because this room used to be his bedroom. He hid behind that door, and I came around the corner, and he jumped out, and he scared me. And it literally scared me. <laughs> <laughs> like, like I, I do not really, I don't have, I don't, I don't live with people, you know what I mean, generally. And so certainly when I have, they weren't people that jumped out of the behind doors and stuff like that. And uh I was pissed off. <laughs> sure. That's what got you mad? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It got me really, really mad. <laughs> and um, and mad enough that he could tell. You know what I mean? And normally, even if I'm mad, people can't tell. Because um, I had my so, emotions. Anyway, so. <laughs> um, but that was the only time where, into that. <laughs> where I was, like, actively annoyed by him. Okay, so don't pull pranks on you. You know, people have pulled pranks on me. Pranks are one thing scaring me. You know, honestly, Zach, son Zach, might be the only person in my entire life who's ever scared me like that. Six, like tried to or succeeded in? I'm sure other people have tried, but he like legitimately, I was not expecting <laughs> gotcha. yeah. that to happen. Yeah. But, <laughs> so like if I flew to Orlando and then podcast host zach let me into your house mm-hmm. and i hid in the closet until you got home and popped out he would be mad at you that would probably legitimately scare you probably yeah, yeah. zach yeah. i don't think zach has a key to my condo i don't did, did i give you a key? Uh, no <laughs> okay no i mean i'm not against it if you want it um, <laughs> yeah I, I do think zach needs a key to your condo soon like before Thursday, it'd be great. Yeah, I don't know why you want James to be mad at you. <laughs> know, right? It's a long way to go. It. You're gonna get... so first you're gonna get on Southwest. You're gonna fly all the way to Orlando. <laughs> yeah, the high quality, smooth skies of Southwest. Just to test whether I'm gonna be mad at you if you jump. <laughs> <laughs> let's see. Let's I wanna, let's see if he really gets mad. No, I it, and I've been mad at people. It, this was like a different level of mad. Like a no annoyed is different than mad. Yeah. Yeah. Cause, uh, cause mad is like, I don't know. I don't know what the difference is. Like one, there are different things. Annoyed is worse in my sure. opinion. Uh, like he did bad things, you know, when he was, I mean, I, when you drop something, you, the other day I broke my cell phone. Mm. Like I, I dropped something on my cell phone, broke the screen. Oh, I man. was mad about that. 
and then annoyed later because I had to fix it. Annoyed is way worse than that <laughs> because of the pain that it took to actually fix it versus the shock of actually dropping something on it. Um, I don't know. Uh, I think the topic that looms over this movie, the idea that you can love your kids and also not like being around them when they're young. I think it's just something people don't talk about. And Mm -hmm. I'm sure it's something that most people have experienced when they have kids. Um, And just like everything else in life, there's shades of how bad that is for people. And for this character, it was, it was very bad. You know what I mean? Like it was an untenable situation for her and for the kids. Uh, It was like a, a boiling pot. And um, you would hope that people would like just go get counseling or do any of the other non-destructive things you could do. Yeah, why didn't she make time for self-care? Jeez. <laughs> I mean, there was lots of things you could do that. besides what she does in this movie, yeah. for sure. Yeah. Um, but I thought it was interesting that she's seeing her prior issues through the lens of this very different person who just happens to have a child, a young child. And who oh, happens yeah, to a be very a different person. There's a lot of class <laughs> stuff going on too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, class and um and also just like generations. Yeah. Difference mm-hmm. in generations. And yeah. Another thing I appreciated was the script I felt like was uh well written and subtle in a way that didn't pander to the audience so so my example for that is um when people asked her where she lived or where she worked she would say cambridge near boston Mm -hmm. and the movie never felt the need to say oh she's a harvard professor like um uh a lot of yeah a lot of other movies would have been like by the way that means she she works at harvard um it gave us enough so that if you wanted to you could put it together okay she lives in cambridge near boston and obviously she's like a a professor. Yeah, you know she says I mean? she's of a like, professor a couple of times. Yeah. yeah. But the movie never feels the need to like lay it out and make it clear. It just it provides the information and if you want to know, you can, you know? Yeah. And I like that subtlety. There's I didn't put some character it being like, oh, Harvard, really, you know, or something like that. Yeah. So exactly. Yeah. And I I would imagine <laughs> that Harvard professors don't go around saying I'm a Harvard professor. They probably say, Yeah, I live in I live near Boston. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like uh, because to avoid that reaction for people, wasn't so she felt... like an? Wasn't she like an author or what was her job? What? Did, how was she, it described? Translator. Translator. Some but, yeah, some sort of linguist. Yeah, yeah, but not like translator for like you know a live speaker. Like yeah, she was mm-hmm. translating works of arts and literature. Hmm. Yeah, I mean that's interesting too, from like a just in retrospect as we sit here and talk about this, like that her job is to take people's words and like convert them to something else when she's like a person who doesn't know how to interpret her own feelings <laughs> or really read other people at all. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I, I enjoyed it. I think probably for it to be top 20 material, unfortunately, on my list, it just needs one more hook. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it just needs one, one more punch at the end. Um, not necessarily even an uplifting punch. Just I felt like it was going places at the end, and then it didn't. Um, like it went farther, but it didn't go all the way, and that kind of left me like, oh, okay, the movie's over. All right, <laughs> sure, cool. <laughs> Uh, And for me, it also had a couple like scenes that I just felt were great little bottle scenes. Like uh, when she went to the movie theater Mm -hmm. and a a group of rowdy kids come in and make a lot of noise and just the utter impotence she has to control the situation. I just found interesting because she's a person that she feels a victim to her circumstance, right? Like she's a victim of her motherhood Mm -hmm. and, uh, she doesn't know how to deal with that. And in this situation, she wants to deal with it. And she just is utterly incapable of dealing with it. And so she leaves. 
And so like little, little scenes like that, I just found striking it like as a short film, I would find it interesting, but then how it supports the movie thematically, I think it was great too. Mm -hmm. I did feel for her at the beginning when she's on this, you know, idyllic (laughs) vacation. And then day two, this large family shows up and like sits in front of her on a beach. And you realize I do not have this place myself anymore. And I have to deal with this large and they're disruptive. Yeah. And I I think we've all been there in some sort of situation too, where we expect one thing to happen and then things change quickly. Yeah. How'd you guys feel about the Ed Harris character? I could have lost him for sure. I didn't like him in this movie. He wasn't really doing much. I thought he was interesting in that it's not, it, I think it just brought out more of just how she doesn't understand people, even good people. <laughs> I mean, like she just doesn't, she doesn't um, think the the same way as other people. I mean, like you can chalk that up to the, her professed selfishness, you know, stuff like that. Um, I mean, maybe by the end of the movie when she actually tells another character I'm selfish, um, maybe that's kind of like, the only character growth she has in the movie is like just realizing that she sees everything through that lens of self versus um, anything else. And um, yeah, I thought it was interesting. I enjoyed it. Can Kyle, you, you need reckon- to watch it again. No. Can you recommend to me a Jesse Buckley movie? I would like, because right now she's over for two. What's the, what's her other one that you didn't oh, like? Remember, I'm thinking of ending things. Um, yeah, but she yeah, wasn't like the reason movie. you didn't like that movie, right? Here's a movie the, you will like. I did, I, but it's a movie. So I've only seen two movies with Jesse Buckley in them. I have yet to like either of them. So I don't know if I like Jesse Buckley because I, I don't like the movie she's been in. Check out her prefer- Wild Rose. Wild Rose is good. Wild Rose. Okay. Uh, a young Scottish singer dreams of making it as a country artist in Nashville after being released from prison. And she isn't actually a singer too, isn't she? It, uh, you mean in real life? Yeah. I don't know. Okay. Um, it has a 3.6 on letterbox, which is pretty good. I um, mean, lost daughter has a 3.8. <laughs> sure. These are very <laughs> different movies. I would say. Think of ending things has a, right. But, Did you like dislike her performance in Lost Daughter? No, I I disliked her character in Lost Daughter. Yeah. So that's not her. That's not her per se. Yeah. No, I I just I just have yet to see a movie of her with her that I like. So I want to see if can I separate the two. She was also in Judy. I haven't seen Judy. She's also, I think, Mm. at the beginning of her like major career so yeah. we'll see more of her in the future i wonder i'm gonna look up what uh her upcoming projects are i need to see the courier benedict Bun- cumberbatch Bunderbatch, <laughs> bunch bumberbatch what's benedict, that guy's name benedict cumberbatch <laughs> rachel brosnan jesse buckley Man, lots of cool people in this movie uh cold war spy and his Russian source try to put an end to the Cuban Missile Crisis. Where has this movie been my whole life? It's been um, uh, no. out there waiting for Wild, it. Wild Rose recommended, and uh, you could watch it with Megan for sure. She she'd probably enjoy it as well. All right. I've um. Added okay. It to the watch list, Kyle. You are going to get your shot to decide if you like her as an actress. Okay. In a different context. Go. Two films. I'm saving the second one for last. Okay. Uh, she's going to be in a movie called Women Talking with uh, Frances McDormand and uh, Rooney Mara about like a cult in Bolivia where um, the men are like doing bad things. Okay. And she's going to be in an Alex Garland film. Oh, which one? Uh, men. Men. Okay. All right. I, I do enjoy Miss Alex Garland. So yeah. we'll see. Okay. I'm open. I'm open. I, I, I don't think she's the reason I like these movies, but just so far she is 0 for 2 in movies that I've seen of hers. Yeah. I think Wild Rose is going to turn you around. He won't watch it. 
No, no, no. It's on the watch list. <laughs> so oh no, I marked it as watch. No, I marked it. I marked it as watch. You marked it as watch. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Good. Uh, well, I've seen it already. <laughs> <laughs> What'd you rate it? <laughs> uh, no stars. Watch list. Okay, there we go. That's awesome. <laughs> okay, let's uh, letterbox this thing. It's on Hulu right now, by the way. Um, letterbox, the lost daughter. I gave it a three and a half. I'll go four. Two and a half. Two and a half. Ouch. Two and a half. I didn't like that it. That seems no, no. For me, a two and a half is like neutral, no opinion. A two and a half is didn't like for you. Yeah, it, it's getting into the. I, ha- I have two and a half is either neutral or I, ha- I had some issues. Like two is into the. I don't like this. I don't know. It's between a two and two and a half. We'll go two and a half right now. Okay. I mean, it's two, the kind of movie feels where a little, two feels a little harsh for it right now. Okay. It's the kind of movie where even if you didn't like it or what it was selling you, it's very adequately made. Yeah. If not made well. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I'm not sure anybody can watch The Lost Daughter and say these acting performances suck. You know what I mean? They are they are what they are. That's the story. And what they're doing is good, I would say, as far as from a performance aspect. I mean, if you were turned off by Olivia Coleman's character, it's because she played it well. Right, right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Exactly. <laughs> because it's kind of a gross character to play. <laughs> if you were turned on by Olivia Coleman's character, I would say she has a problem with the performance. Um, all right. So a two and a half, a three and a half, and a four for the lost daughter. Uh what a barn burner. I kind of wish Netflix it, available on Netflix. Yeah, I kind of wish it just had um like some of it felt a little bit like Hitchcockian to me. I kind of wish they had gone full, you know, at the end. Like full thriller. Full, yeah, full thriller. Turned it into full thriller. And then Olivia Her Coleman daughters could, show up with, like, guns. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and it could turn into, like, a martial arts movie. Olivia <laughs> Coleman just <laughs> dispatching. I, I, just last 10 minutes. Italian anime. gangsters. <laughs> yeah. Well, they, they do allude to that family possibly being connected In the mafia. to something. Oh, yeah. So, like, it, there were the seeds to it going somewhere. It just, that's not the movie that they're making. Yeah. I'm trying to think of any other movie though. That's like a serious meditation on, uh, like being annoyed with your kids or, you know, motherhood not being all it's cracked up to be. Like, I can't really think I'm sure they're out there, but I, I can't think of one. Well, I mean, would you count the Babadook or is that too genre being a horror film? I mean, I think Babadook does it, as well as you can within the context of a horror movie. Okay. You know what I mean? Like as sensitively as you can within the context of being a horror movie, but like, no, just like a straight drama. That's about that. About Um, Yeah. Where your main character never actually redeems anything. Is that spoiler? I don't know. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't think it exists because I just think it's an impossible movie to make. Um, would you guys? I know we already rated it, but Maggie Gyllenhaal on board for the next one or totally swing and a miss? Definitely. Yeah, I, I didn't find anything amazing or bad with the directing. I thought it was competently directed, so I would watch the next one. Yeah, I mean, it depends on what the topic is, but yeah, I uh, I'm into it. Thought it was good. She also is the one that adapted the screenplay. Yeah. I mean, for a first effort, like I listened to, a, I think it was maybe the Q&A podcast with her. It was like the first thing she's ever written. That's kind of impressive. Yeah. <laughs> That's kind of crazy. Um, that, that would be the first thing out of the box. I mean, she had a book that she was adapting, so that was helpful by her own admission on that podcast. But um but yeah, I don't think too many people can just write something that's that can be performed that well and then direct it, write it and direct it for the first time. I'm hoping she has a lot more headed our way. Would you rather see Maggie Gyllenhaal on screen or making movies like The Lost Daughter? Directing. Me too. Yeah. I'm nothing wrong with her acting, but I think if she's going to be telling 
different stories. Like, even though I didn't care for this story, you mm -hmm. are correct, James. This is not a story we've seen made very often in movies or if at all. I'm sure there are other movies out there about parents not liking their kids, but I can't think of any off the top of my head. So have she's going to keep doing this. Have you ever seen Sherry Baby? I think that's what no. it's called. Sherry Baby. Sherry. Oh. Uh, yeah, it is. Yeah. Sherry is Baby. Is it Sherry Baby? Yeah. She's so good in that movie, and it's also a character that's like hard to like. Uh, you never seen Cherry Baby? No. Kyle, never heard of it. Never heard of it. It's a good one, but her character is hard to like. She's like a hardcore alcoholic, and she's got a daughter that she gets out of prison, and uh, she's an alcoholic. I already mentioned that. <laughs> so she gets out of prison. <laughs> She's an, and then she's an alcoholic and she's an alcoholic and okay. she's trying to get her kid back and so but she does well she does well until she doesn't type of thing because she's is, an alcoholic which is the pattern with alcoholics yeah. and recently out of prison right recently yeah. out of prison alcohol her daughter back um <laughs> so it's which a heartbreak it's a heartbreaking alcoholic. movie because it's a, it's a movie about somebody who's trying and she just every step of the way gets in 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 her own way basically um it's like it's, flight for motherhood um no i wouldn't <laughs> say it's anything like flight for motherhood but <laughs> what's your opinion on flight i know zach's I like, opinion i, I think like we flight. talked about it on the podcast oh, okay. kyle I like it. that's zemeckis isn't it it's a i believe it was yeah. a zemeckis movie yeah, no, I, I liked it. I I think it's a good Denzel Washington performance because I do think he's a good actor. FYI, <laughs> from last week. Wow, if you got to say it. Then shocking turn. I know, no, I I I do like Denzel Washington. Um, I mean, like, so the actual flying setup stuff might be a little silly, mm -hmm. but I really like everything that comes after that with the investigation, with how his addictions play into it um the john goodman character is great in that movie mm -hmm. um so yeah so I, I like flight john goodman plays the coke dealer right or something right like yeah exactly <laughs> yeah isn't that right isn't he a coke dealer he is yeah he it, he's the one who's trying to like balance out denzel washington like oh you're you're a little too drunk here have some of this and you're a little too high have some of that and you know like right. this keeps giving him more and more drugs to get him to, to as close to equal as possible. Didn't we see flight with Julie? Zach? I don't remember. I'm not I, sure. I, I know you and I, I'm pretty sure you and I went to like a press screening of flight back in the day when we were going to press screenings. Yeah. I feel like we would have seen that Sully movie with Julie. That could be. Yeah. Um, I, I do not miss press screenings. That's for sure. Oh, you didn't like that? No, it was fun. I don't miss having <laughs> to be at the movie theater at a very specific time. Like, like you always, don't like it. Uh, that was always uh, like, like <laughs> it was always like, like the worst ahead, time to drive. <laughs> it was always like the worst time to drive. That's when they wanted. <laughs> okay. Yeah. No, that's right. You're like locked into a, a very particular time and uh, location. You have to be. No, 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 no. See. The difference is I didn't get to pick the time or location. Yeah. I get it's to well, pick the time or location when I pre-purchase the ticket with yeah. a specific seat. Yeah. In this case, not only did you have to be on their time and at their location, but you also didn't get a reserved seat. So you oh, had to be there. It's like the worst way of both worlds. Yeah. And you yeah. knew it was going to be full because it was yeah. oh, it was almost always full. So you had to be there yeah. early to get a decent seat. Um yeah, I don't miss any of those games for sure. I heard an interesting argument. I'm going to take this way back to our the the seats of the pre assignment, but the mm -hmm. argument was assigned seating has hurt smaller movies because you don't have the spillover effect anymore of people showing up on a Saturday night to see the big movie. It's sold out but they're still there. So then they go see, well, what else is playing? And then they end up seeing that second or third tier movie. So those smaller movies are missing on a box office because they, a lot of their money came from spillover and they're not getting hmm. it anymore. I don't know if that's true or not, but I think it's an interesting argument for one of the effects of the 
you know, purchase your seat in advance economy we have now. Yeah, I don't have any proof as far as like statistics or anything yeah. like that, but um through my own experience, I would say uh that's bull crap. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, well, strong opinion that well, I mean wrong. because I mean maybe it's just the theaters that I have access to. But if you want to go see Spider-Man No Way Home on opening weekend, it's playing every 15 minutes. And it's playing so often in so many theaters. There's maybe the one you showed up to is sold out, but the next one is not. Or the one after that that starts a half an hour later is not. And so people are not uh, choosing to go see The Lost Daughter over Spider-Man because they might have to wait half an hour. You know what I mean? It's just in a world where there was only one or two theaters playing Spider-Man and you literally might not have seen it that weekend because they were constantly sold out. Sure. I believe that. But in the world we live in right now where a theater can literally just snap their fingers and have another theater playing the digital print. Yeah. I don't, I don't believe that like the theaters are just going to play the movies that people buy tickets to. (laughs) And, um, I'm not sure depending on your movie being less popular is a good box office strategy. I don't think it's depending on. It's more (laughs) of we're in the theater and we're going to get some spillover. Right. But if part of your, if part of the money you plan on making in a theater is because the more popular movie is going to sell out, so maybe we'll get a couple (laughs) cast offs. That's not a great look. I would. Say. I do think a lot of people plan on like, well, we're definitely not going to get number one this week because Batman comes out. But yeah. we're hoping to get number two. You know, I could see counter programming because we're not Batman and not everybody wants to see Batman. That's counter programming. Being like, I really hope the theaters are so sold out on Batman <laughs> that somebody comes and sees our movie. That's not a great strategy. I would say. Maybe market your movie as opposed to just hoping that the other one sells out. So, James, is your argument that that doesn't happen then? That people uh, can't get into their their sold out film and so they don't go to a different movie. Instead, they just go home. That's what used to happen. My argument is that I don't think you can blame reserved seating for the decline of... (laughs) indie films because people can now reserve a seat. Therefore they won't get tricked into watching a movie. They didn't want to watch anyway. Let's agree. You can't blame the decline of indie film on that. Right. (laughs) But just as like a, as a consequence, do you think that that ever was the case that indie films were helped because some people went to a different movie because of a sold out theater? I mean, not even indie. I think we have this disappearance of that mid level movie. I think those are the ones that are yeah. being held. Like a $40 million. Exactly. Because now everything is either huge or tiny. There's no middle ground. And I wonder if the middle ground is what suffered from this lack of, from, from um, a science. Because I just feel like back in the day, a group of, you know, five 20 year olds would show up at the theater without any plan. And then once they got there, they would just look at the board and decide what they're going to go to. I think that was a kind of a, a common thing. And uh, it just doesn't happen the same way now. But back then I could say like, oh, well, this one's full. So let's go to that one, you know? Um, Yeah, I mean, I'm not going to say that no film has ever benefited from bigger movies being sold out. That would be silly. I'm sure that's happened. Um, Probably happens less now because people know for sure that they have a seat. That's exactly what I'm saying. But yeah. I think you're talking such little money that just at the margins. Yeah. I okay. Mean, <laughs> again, I, I don't think um, you're talking about a huge difference, but maybe it is. I yeah. don't know. Maybe the model did have a large element of just being in the theater with a big movie. Well, I don't think Kyle's, stipulating a huge or large difference just Mm -hmm. just a noticeable difference no exactly yeah i i also i was reading up on the movie remember titanic guys from like the Mm -hmm. 90s Mm -hmm. yeah and that indie movie well no so that movie 
peaked in week five. Mm-hmm. Like that's when it hit its it, it wasn't week one, two, three. So and like I was trying to think, have we had any other movies that have had that kind of word of mouth growth to them? Because now every movie expects to make its money, especially something huge like Titanic in week one. And the fact that Titanic took five weeks to gain steam and then didn't go away for like a year after that. What's the the forest scary ghost movie? The forest Blair scary Witch ghost project? Movie? Yeah, Blair Witch. I'm sure that didn't peak week one. Yeah, but okay, so but that's also a movie from the last century. I also don't think like it I'm trying peaked. to think like a modern example of this. As far as like I don't think it ever hit number one. But maybe Oh, it never hit number one? I don't think so. No. Oh. But I might be wrong. I think it was a fairly like it was definitely a big hit, but it was not like a number one for weeks type hit. Or even but it was a word of mouth hit though, for sure. I mean, the Matrix, especially was a if you hit. were of a specific age, which yeah, you know, I think you guys were probably on the lower end of that, and I was probably on the higher end of that when that movie came out. Um, yeah. Movies have changed so much, just the act of like going to them in the last 20 years. It's crazy. I remember when, uh, uh, I don't know why this is turning into this, this episode, but um, I remember when movie theaters in this area converted to stadium seating. <laughs> and it was like a big deal that there was like one theater down in Celebration, which is like 45 minutes away from me, had like, it was a brand new movie theater that had two theaters and both of them were stadium seating. And we would drive all the way down there just to sit in stadium seating and no other theater in Orlando had stadium. Oh seating. yeah. Yeah. Um, and now it's pretty much standard. Like you'd have to search for a theater that doesn't have stadium seating at this point. Man, Spider-Man is still number one in the box office right now. Is it really? Yeah. I mean, what else has come out? Uh, not- scream, but I'm just like, why hasn't something some something else should swoop in right now and take number one? Could, yeah, it could. Yeah. I yeah, I mean, before the podcast that I mentioned, or on the podcast, I mentioned that I haven't seen anything in January in a movie theater. Yeah. And uh that's kind of crazy. I mean, not I'm that January is normally action packed or anything, but there's I'm literally you're not going to nothing. see Scream. You're a Scream fan. I like Scream, and I should probably go see Scream, but I have been unmotivated. I didn't hear bad things or good things about it. I literally heard zero about it. That's sure. not good. Hey, can I ask you guys if you've ever done this? Have you ever, back in the day, mm-hmm. bought... It, it, this is another thing to Kyle's point, because I know people did this, and I'm just curious if you did. Bought a ticket for a movie that you wanted to do well in the box office, but then went and saw a different movie. I never did that. No. That's something that people used to do is they'd buy a ticket for like some movie they want to support, even though they were going to a different movie that they didn't necessarily care about supporting by people. You mean you? Yeah. Um, I don't know if I ever did that, but (laughs) I've no people would definitely do like not everyone, obviously who's doing Uh, that. Everyone, everyone was doing it. James, (laughs) No, I Lots mean it was enough people. that people it was are a th- talking. No, it was enough that it was a thing. You guys have heard of this, right? Are you saying I, you haven't heard of this behavior? I, I, not for movies. I, I've heard of this for. Um, I I mean I, I guess I remember the last time I heard this was, was like Captain Marvel. Like people were buying tickets to Captain Marvel and not showing up just because they wanted to do well because there was all this backlash to it. Yeah, I, I heard about that with uh, Black Panther too. Like yeah. people buying blocks of tickets even though they never planned on using them they just but that, that's Black happening Panther now be huge money. so so what, what what's the idea here is there's a movie you want to do well but you don't want to see it so you buy no, no. a ticket to it and then go see a different movie no no maybe you've already seen it and you're okay. like this is the best i want to support this film like so that more films like this are made but then i'm also going to go see the latest popcorn movie i've no i've not heard of this happening this is news to me it, you've this never heard is, of this happening this used to happen this no, is a thing. I, I mean, if it was a thing, I don't, it's not a thing that I stored in my memory banks of like, hey, in 20 years, gotta remember <laughs> when people used to do this. I will say, uh, when I was in my teens and 20s, none of us were doing that. And so I, uh, I 
don't think I know anybody that's ever done that. So I'm not saying nobody ever did that, but I don't think I've ever met anybody that did that unless Even, Zach, you've uh, done that. I will You're say maybe I, the only person no, I can imagine doing that. I just had a memory. I absolutely did this. I did this when I had movie pass all the time. I would movie pass it for a movie that I wanted them to get the money more than whatever movie I was going to. Hmm. So that's why would you do that on thing. movie that's passes? Like a five years ago thing. Yeah. Why would you do that on movie passes dying, but not your own? No, I'm, I'm not saying I didn't, I don't remember if I did it. This would have been 20 years ago or whatever, but for movie pass, yeah. I do remember doing that. Oh, okay. Yeah. This is not a thing, Zach. I think it's a thing. <laughs> I think it's probably been done, but yeah. I don't think it's a thing. <laughs> it, it wasn't like you guys remember in the nineties when people were just constantly buying movie tickets for other movies. We don't need to ratchet it up to constantly. I'm just saying this was a behavior that some people partook in enough right. to where it was a, a behavior that people were aware of. But I think your average person knows nobody that has yeah. done that. Uh, well, okay. I don't know how you quantify that. This is good. This is a good show. Good show. All right. And good this show. is the final episode of Center Realist. Support your local theaters. Exactly. Whether you go or not, pay that membership fee. <laughs> sure. Yeah. I mean, that's the only reason I don't feel bad about not seeing a movie in January and still giving AMC my $22. Because I'm keeping a very wealthy company alive. <laughs> yes. <you're right. laughs> Supporting <laughs> business. AMC will close as many theaters as they have to so they don't need to fire a CEO. I mean, the sad part is, m by me not going, the people who actually made the movies get nothing. <laughs> you know what I mean? I should have just bought the tickets and not showed up. Because yeah. then at least the James, studios. <laughs> that line of thinking is exactly <laughs> what I'm saying. Led people to buy tickets to different movies. You uh, had an right. independent thought that many people had before. Right, but they don't actually do it. That's what I'm saying. Like, uh, I think it's a thing, as in people think that happens, but it doesn't happen. Just like I'm not going to buy tickets and not show up. Because I'm pretty sure they'll cancel my account if I do that enough. So <laughs> That's funny. All right. Well, thank you for listening to uh, whatever this was. <laughs> Episode uh, 515 of The Cinerealist. We appreciate you listening, especially if you've gotten this far. Uh, thanks for listening. Don't forget, you can always uh, watch this podcast on YouTube. You could support us on Patreon. You could leave us an Apple podcast review. All of those things, we'd appreciate you taking the time to explore. You could also send us an email to heyguys at cinerealist.com. We appreciate all the emails. You could follow us on social media on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook or TikTok, or you could follow me on my personal Twitter or Letterboxd account at YoJRB. You follow me on Twitter or Letterboxd at Shobin. You can find me on Letterboxd at Peter SKB. We will be back next week watching the movie Licorice Pizza from Paul Thomas Anderson. This is a listener recommendation from Logan. He recommended we watch it. So we're going to watch it uh, as long as we can get to the theater before it leaves theaters. For some reason on this one, we've left it to like the last possible weekend. It's going to be in theaters in Orlando. So uh, hopefully we'll get to it. We're going to try and we'll be watching that one and discussing it for next weekend. Uh, we'll see you guys there. Until then, keep it real.
You're still here? It's over. Go home. Go.